So thanks for joining. Today we're going to be talking about how to detect silent machine learning failures in models and machine learning models that are deployed to production. So this presentation serves as a kind of introduction to machine learning monitoring. Uh, let's start with the agenda first. And with the agenda, we have three main items. First ones are two main reasons why machine learning models can fail in production. And these are the data drift and concept drift. We're going to define them. We're going to put some intuition behind them. And we're going to see how they can impact your performance once you deploy your models to production. Then we're going to talk about performance estimation and performance calculation, why you should always keep track of the performance of machine learning models, so the technical metrics that you use to evaluate your models and why it's normally not possible to just simply calculate performance and you need to try to estimate somehow. And then as kind of a way to troubleshoot the issues with performance, we're going to go to data drip and concept of detection. So we're going to try to figure out why our machine learning models are not performing as well as they used to. And then uh, hopefully can do something to fix these issues. Uh, before we jump into it, I'm going to set the stage with a um, Example use case for uh, binary classification that's very popular in finance and banking, uh, which is the load different prediction. And I'm gonna be referring to that throughout the presentation. So here we simply take the credit scores and the customer information as our model features. And we're trying to predict whether somebody is going to default on a loan or not within one year. So our target here is just non-payment within one year. And as a, our technical metric, as a way to evaluate the performance for development and then uh, after deployment, we're gonna be using ROC AUC. It's a typical metric that you can use, of course. So and jump into it. Before we can define what data different concept drift are, uh, we need a quick refresher on what we're actually trying to do uh, when we train a machine learning model. Um, so just to walk you through this quickly, there is a true pattern in reality that we're trying to capture. To do that, we need to sample some of the data from, from reality. And this actually becomes our data that we will work with uh, during our development. So we maybe split it into the test uh, data set, the validation data set, and the train data set. And here, as an example, we have a true pattern, which is kind of a sigmoid function when we're trying to predict whether a given point belongs to a positive or negative class. There is just one feature, feature X, and we see as feature X increases, also the relative frequency of the negative class will increase. And if we sample from this, this pattern, this population, we'll be getting some kind of data. Now, let's jump to data drift. Uh, if data drift happens, what changes is the distribution of model inputs. So the true pattern is pure data drift or covariate shift, also known as covariate shift. And the true pattern will remain unchanged. So the thing that we're actually trying to learn will remain unchanged. But the way we sample the data or the data is sampled from reality, maybe our um, people get older. That way, something of the data will change because it's mostly going to be older people who apply for our loans. Uh, and that way also the data distribution in uh, that our model is working with our model is processing is going to change. And data drift does not always mean dropping performance. We can have data drift uh, that does not influence performance or in some edge cases, it can even influence performance positively. And before I go deeper there, let's quickly define what data drift is. So it's just the change in joint model distribution, model input distribution. So it's the P of X that changes. It can be that it shifts to the left, to the right. Maybe there is some more complex data drift when the correlations between features change. So the joint distribution changes. But if you look at distribution per feature, it will still look reasonably similar or even exactly the same. Um, and to just quickly build an intuition uh, how data drift can impact performance, imagine that you have a um, data set where there's some regions in your model input space where you know that it's going to be a positive class. Maybe high income, uh, old people with good credit score, they will always pay back the loan. So you know that people there, they are very easy to predict. That means that your performance of your model is most of your data comes from that region is going to be quite high. But then if you, if the data, if your population changes, or if your sample changes, uh, maybe to people who have worse credit scores, 
it's much harder to predict whether you're going to default on the loan or not. That means that the uh, performance of your model will drop and that will impact your, uh, your business metrics and your bottom line. Of course, it doesn't always uh, impact your performance and we'll uh, talk about it more later on when we talk about performance estimation. Now let's talk about concept. So again, we look at the true pattern, the sampling and the data that uh, basically uh, we get from these two. So if we have pure concept drift, uh, what changes is this true pattern that we're trying to learn. Uh, and we see that now um, this pattern was very sigmoidal and now it became uh, slightly more linear. So there is a change in this true underlying pattern, this true underlying function or mapping uh, that we, are, we have learned. And now what the model has learned is no longer fully relevant. That means that the performance of our machine learning models is almost always to be negatively affected and can lead to really significant drop in performance. So this is something that if we can detect concept drift, we know that our models are not performing well. With data drift, the issue is slightly more nuanced. And as before, let's define what concept drift is. So concept drift uh, can be quickly defined in a formal way as the change in the underlying concept or the pattern or the mapping or the function between the target and the model input. So it's the probability of the target y given model inputs. Um, and here, another way to visualize it is kind of looking at uh, class boundaries. So again, imagine our uh, long default prediction uh, use case. And maybe the red people are the people who are going to default and uh, the data points in blue are the people who are not going to default. Uh, so we here see that our true class distributions uh, are uh, clearly, uh, sorry, there is some kind of class boundary, true class boundary between the positive and negative examples. And as this pattern changes, this concept between target and the model inputs changes, this class boundary is also going to change. And that means um, that our models will learn uh, the pattern on the training data. Hopefully they learn uh, this pattern quite accurately. And then even though the model could be, you know, absolutely perfect, it will fail and will, the performance will drop significantly uh, once we deploy it, if our production data is different. And that kind of uh, change is also an example of uh, training serving skew, which is a term you might have heard before, uh, which basically means that the distribution and the patterns in your training data are different than the distributions and the pattern in your production data. Uh, so now we define two main reasons why performance may drop. Now let's kind of go to the most important method that we should be tracking, which is performance. Let's first discuss why we should be tracking performance, why we cannot just say, let's detect data drift. If there's data drift, things are different, which means that our models are not good. And it's simply because it's not really true. As I mentioned, data drift can happen without affecting performance. If your data moves from one region where the model is very highly performant to another region where the model is equally performant, nothing really will change. And you will still have the same performance metrics, same, um, same KPIs. Uh, and that is particularly true for models that are very robust. So you could think about language models or um, image recognition models when really what we're trying to capture is some kind of reasonably fundamental concept that doesn't change much. And even if it changes, it's most likely going to be just change in population and not change in the concept. Uh, so just monitoring for data drift is not enough because it doesn't always imply performance drop. Uh, the first uh, reason. Then the second reason is kind of a trivial one, which is this is something that we optimize in training. So it doesn't really make sense to continue uh, to just stop looking at it. It's just, you know, us trying to evaluate something and then not looking at the same metric ever again. So we should continue to uh, look at performance and fix if there's any issues with performance after we deploy our models. And the last thing kind of from a more business perspective is that when we um, create our model, we should define our metric in a way that's in line with the business goals and the business impact. Uh, so in case of credit scoring, our evaluation metric should be something like maybe F beta score when we are trying to see what is the impact of every uh, default and every reject spreading and we weigh them appropriately. Uh, so since we hopefully 
created our technical metrics to be a proxy for business impact. Um, this is something that we always should have in mind as data scientists, that in the end, what we're trying to do is to create as much business impact as possible uh, with the data we have and with the patterns that are there. Uh, so it's a business impact proxy. We should uh, track performance after we deploy our, our models to production. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about how we can do it. So the first thing uh, we should think about is to calculate uh, the performance after we deploy our models. The issues there are, however, that it's simply not possible in most cases. Looking at our example use case, you make a prediction and then you need to wait an entire year uh, to see whether this prediction was correct or not. So we're dealing with delayed target data here. So the labels are actually delayed and we can simply do it. Uh, and this is something that normally the case, anytime we're trying to predict something that's reasonably far in the future or can be, can be far in the future. So survival analysis are uh, trying to make long-term predictions related to literally anything. Another uh, issue with to simply calculating performance is not having complete access to labels. And again, imagine that you wait this year and you finally get the results. Uh, you will actually only get part of the labels because for every prediction, when you say that the person is not going to be pulled, the loan was given, and you know whether this was a false negative or true negative, and whether the default prediction was negative and was correct or was negative and was incorrect. However, you don't know uh, whether your predictions about people who you decided to reject uh, were correct or not. So maybe uh, people that the model set is going to default actually would not have defaulted had they been given the loan. Uh, so we cannot really compute the full confusion matrix. We only get the false negatives and the true negatives here, uh, which means that computing some methods might be uh, might be a challenge. And there's methods like uh, reject inference that are trying to deal with that to some extent, but they never provide true labels. And uh, the last reason why we rarely have access to ground truth is that even if we're not trying to predict something, uh, we are most likely going to try to automate some kind of uh, task that was uh, performed by, by a human before, uh, most likely a menial task like document classification, trying to detect objects in an image, things like that. And then the whole purpose of the use case is to automate and save on labor costs. Uh, and that means that uh, getting these labels would mean making people do this uh, labor manually again, which would defeat the whole purpose of, of automating it. And then you can do things like spot checks when you say get 1% of all data and either sample randomly in some smart way and um, you have them manually evaluated to get some kind of idea what is the model performance. But again, you don't get full labels and you only get a small percentage of fully labeled data. So the answer then is how can we uh, monitor performance is really to estimate it. And so now, Let's move to kind of the most important part of the presentation and kind of the USP that we developed at NaniML. And as far as I know, and NaniML is the only open source Python library uh, that allows you to estimate the performance of your machine learning models without access to the target data. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of how the algorithm works. If you're interested in the details, you can delve into the documentation and into the code later on. Uh, so here, what we see is we see a data distribution on the left, uh, which can be thought of as our, let's say, validation distribution. So the one that we're trying to use as our reference when we know the performance for a part. And the data distribution on the right uh, can be seen as our analysis data set. So the, the data set for which we want to uh, see or estimate the performance. And uh, the uh, regions in green, so kind of the wings of this butterfly, are the regions when the model is quite confident about its predictions. The regions in red are the regions when the model is not very confident to predictions. So you can say that maybe one of these kind of wings of the butterfly, as the data set resembles slightly a butterfly, uh, can be where most of class one is, and the other wing can be where the most of class zero is. And the red region uh, could be uh, a decision boundary. Uh, this, by the way, example is just generated randomly data set and we try to train the classifier and we saw what is the uh, confidence level. So actual uh, distribution of confidence of the model is going to look 
more or less like that. And uh, what you see and what you can kind of expect is that if the model is confident, as long as it's reasonably correct in its confidence, uh, the model will perform better on given data point. So the data point here that's in deep blue, the model is more likely to classify correctly than a uh, data point that's right in the middle of the red region. And now let's talk about what this confidence really means. So what we mean by confidence is some kind of way of a model to establish how likely it is to make a correct prediction. And the way we do it is through so-called probability calibration. So when you get your classification model, let's say you train in XGBoost. Uh, when you train your model, you will get a value between zero and one for classification models. Um, that corresponds to the probability that a given model is going to be belong to the, uh, class one. If this value is close to one or to zero, then the model is confident. If, the, if this value is close to 0 0.5, the model is not confident. However, there is a, a trick here uh, or like a, a small obstacle, which is that these numbers don't actually correspond to probabilities. So we need to calibrate those. And calibrating just means uh, adjusting these numbers that are already in some way rank ordered to make sure that they actually correspond to probabilities, which means that if the value of a prediction is 0 0.7, there is actually 70% chance that this model uh, belongs on average to class one. And there's a probability calibration is reasonably well researched uh, field of study, and you can just do uh, you can just do it in circuit length, so I won't delve into details. Nanino also does probability calibration behind the scenes, so you don't need to have your properties well calibrated to use Nanino. You can just input anything, and the calibration is going to be done behind the scenes. And now, assuming well calibrated models and having this intuition that if the model is more confident, uh, it will perform better, we can actually try to estimate performance. And the way we do it is we're going to take at every single point in our analysis data set after calibrating uh, the probabilities on our reference data set. And uh, we're going to create a partial confusion matrix. So what that means is we're gonna take a number and we're gonna take a given threshold to make some kind of business decision based on the uh, prediction in binary classification setting. You need to threshold it. You need to decide whether this is gonna be a yes or a no. Let's say that our threshold is 0 0.5, just for simplicity's sake. Uh, so we have this threshold, which is 0 0.5, and we know that our prediction, let's say 0 0.7. We know that the prediction is above the threshold, so we know for a fact that this is going to be a positive prediction. And we know, again, for a fact, because the probabilities are well calibrated, that there is a 70% chance that this prediction is going to be true. So we know that there's 70% chance that it's a true positive and 30% chance that it's a false positive. That means that we can create a confusion matrix with 0 0.7 in the true positive column, uh, sorry, cell, and 0 0.3 in the false positive cell, and 0 uh, in both uh, negative column cells. And we're going to do that for every single data point in our analysis data set, which can be, let's say, last week of your uh, production data, last hour, depending on, on the data volume. Uh, then we're going to take all these partial uh, Confusion, uh, confusion matrices, and we're going to simply sum them. What we end up with is, assuming well calibrated probabilities, expected confusion matrix uh, for a given model and a given data set according to the model itself. So, model itself kind of gives you the estimated performance via this algorithm. And then we can reasonably simply take that and calculate any metric you want, including rogue AUC. Then, of course, you'll have to vary the threshold a bit. And so you're going to get multiple of the confusion matrices, uh, but you'll be able to get an expected metric. That's basically it. Uh, now to give you a real life example that you should all be familiar with, sorry, uh, which is the California housing data set. We took uh, this data set, we transformed it a bit, we created, uh, we trained uh, some kind of SVM on it, uh, we turned it into a binary classification problem uh, for the purposes of this presentation. And you see that the estimated work AUC and the realized work AUC are reasonably similar. Uh, it's worth mentioning that everything we talked about uh, works perfectly fine uh, with any kind of data drift. So if there is data drift in your, uh, in your use case, 
you will be able to estimate uh, performance with this algorithm without any biases and reasonably accurately. So it actually gives an unbiased estimate of your performance. However, if there's concept drift, all bets are off. We are right now don't have a way to really estimate concept drift, especially if it's not associated with data drift in any way. And it might be one of these things that are simply not possible to do, but we're working on it. Now that we know how to estimate performance, especially performance change due to data drift, which is something that honestly happens much more often in concept drift. Uh, let's talk about how we can detect data drift to find out underlying reasons for change in performance. Um, so the first thing, the first way to do it is looking at each feature separately. So doing so-called univariate data drift detection. And uh, we can do it um, by taking the feature in our reference data set. So again, the data set for which we know everything is doing fine. It can be our validation data set for which we know that the performance was satisfactory. And in an, our analysis data set, which can be literally any, any part of the data we want. And then what we do is we're gonna run a preset statistical test. For each feature that is categorical, we're gonna run a chi-square test. For each continuous feature, we're gonna run a KS test. And they will just give us basically statistical um, indications of whether the distributions are the same or not and how strongly they are different. Uh, we can then use those basically as signals for our data drift, uh, but there are a few shortcomings. So good thing is that these things are fully interpretable. You can really interpret that this feature changed by that much, and that means that maybe there's some issues. However, uh, they are limited in two ways. First of all, they will give you a lot of uh, false positives as things might change from the statistical perspective, even if you put your p-value quite low, and the uh, things can uh, p-value cut up quite low, the things will change from the statistical perspective, but that does not necessarily mean that they change from model monitoring perspective. So whether there's actual impact on performance. And that means you will get a lot of false positives. And if you have, let's say 300 features in your model, um, you will basically be drowned in alerts and it will not be actionable in any shape or form because you will not be able to manually really look at multiple alerts every day. So um, the, other, uh, the other shortcoming is that uh, they assume that every feature is in a sense independent and look at it feature by feature. So they, these tests and these ways do not consider uh, changes in data that are more subtle and change the data structure without affecting significantly the single distribution. So let's say that the correlations between features change, but the feature distributions don't change much. Um, univariate uh, data drift detection methods will not capture that. So you will not be able to see these changes. And these changes might be actually more important, especially if you have uh, complex patterns in your data and use complex models to find them, which is basically a standard in, in today's data science. So what we can do instead is we can look at the multivariate data drift detection methods. And here again, we look at one of the algorithms that we developed at Manuela, which is also reasonably uh, novel. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna try to find change in the structure of the data. And the way we can do it is we're gonna um, compress the data set or reduce dimensionality in a data set via a learned model that learns the structure of the data. So it can be anything that basically can fit to your reference data. We're gonna fit this dimensionality reductor or this compressor to uh, our reference data. We're gonna reduce dimensionality and then we're gonna do the reverse, inverse transform. So we're gonna decompress the data back to the original space and we're gonna restore the original uh, number of dimensions. Then we're gonna get reconstructed data. And because the data passes through some kind of you know, narrow passage or narrow throat, uh, what, will, what will happen is we're gonna have some kind of um, changes in the data uh, and maybe some kind of denoising. So the reconstructed data is not going to match 100% the original data. And then we can use this change between reconstructed and original data um, to capture all kinds of data drift in one number. Let's delve deeper. So first let's talk about the requirements of this compressor. So, or this encoding. It, as I already mentioned, needs to learn the internal structure of data. 
it's not reduced by dimensionality. So we have some kind of factor that squeezes the information. Um, inverse transformation needs to be possible because we need to be able to uh, compute this so-called reconstruction error. So the change between original data and the constructed data. And one important requirement is that the latent structure of um, mm, the data after the compression needs to map in a stable way to the original space. So let's say if you took uh, autoencoder, not the variation autoencoder, but simple autoencoder, uh, you would not be able to use it here because uh, the mapping between uh, the latent space and the original space is very, very unstable. And small perturbations uh, in latent space can lead to huge changes in the original space after the inverse transform. Uh, so we have this compressor and then uh, we're gonna fit it on in the reference data and then we're going to transform uh, the analysis data and we're going to do the inverse transform right after that on the, of the same analysis data. And then we're going to compare the original analysis data to the reconstructed analysis data. I'm gonna afterwards measure the dislocation of points before and after the reconstruction. And in here, any distance metric could work. For that, we're just using very sim simple as possible metric, which is just the mean of Euclidean distances between the original and reconstructed points. And we get our reconstruction error, which is one metric that actually uh, tells you about the magnitude of the data drift. And bear in mind here that it doesn't tell you about the magnitude of data drift in function or as a function of performance, just how strong this data drift is changing. So it still does not necessarily map to uh, performance, uh, but it gives you a strong indication. And um, interestingly enough, if the reconstruction error stays roughly the same, it will start at zero, which is important to notice because we will always use some kind of information if we need to reduce dimensionality. So it will start at certain value. This is going to be our kind of, you know, the benchmark value. If it increases significantly above this value, we have data drift. But if it decreases significantly below this value, that in some edge cases, it's also possible that there's data drift. And the reason for that is that maybe our uh, compressor was not very good at capturing the, the data, or maybe the pattern was sorry, the pattern in the data, the structure of the data, or maybe the structure of the data was very complex uh, and the capture structure of the data was much simpler. And now the structure became simpler. So the model is better at reconstructing it. And that of course means also that the structure of the data has changed, but from uh, more complex to simpler instead of just changing in some other way. So that's data reconstruction. And again, let's look at the example. As I already mentioned, there are some uh, even simple data sets. So here's again, another very simple synthetic data set this time. And when we look at just two features, uh, distributed simple 2D Gaussian, uh, and let's say that our reference data is the blue, uh, data points in blue, and our analysis data are the data points in orange. And you will see that even if you look at it from one dimensional distribution perspective, these data sets are the same, they're obviously not. If you compute a case statistics for both feature one and feature two, and if you compute any kind of you know, uh, statistical measures that are related to just uh, 1D distribution, you will see that there's no changes. Uh, so for that, we need to look at multivariate approaches. And here, if we look at it from the data reconstruct using the data reconstruction error, um, method, uh, you will see that there is a very significant jump when um, the data changes uh, from you know, the green one to the orange one. And that's really it. So now uh, let's go to the summary and let's talk about kind of the key, um, key insights from the presentation. So the first one is data drift and concept drift are the main reasons why performance of your models uh, can decrease and can lead to uh, silent model failure. Uh, and while concept drift generally tends to lead to drop in performance, data drift uh, does not always lead to drop in performance. In general, data drift, especially in variant one, is a very weak signal, if at all, of performance. Uh, so for that, it's really necessary to measure performance in your machine learning models uh, after they have been deployed, but production targets are sadly often not available to calculate the performance. And for that, we need to be able to estimate the performance 
um, without access to target data. And this is really the key to machine learning monitoring. And kind of as an addition to that, um, after we've done that, we should try to some way troubleshoot and um, some kind of root cause analysis of what exactly happened. And there, data detection can be very helpful, both the univariate and the multivariate approach. Uh, so that is it. Thanks for listening. And as I mentioned, we are fully open source, uh, fully free. So check out our GitHub, uh, we're using Python. Uh, you can simply pip install the library and give it a try. Uh, and also feel free to add me on LinkedIn if you have any questions or you'd like to get to know more. Uh, so thanks a lot. And now let's do a quick uh, Q&A session. I see a few things in chat. Uh, yes, maybe you can uh, help me here. Uh, hi, Wojtek. So there are some, uh, yeah, so that uh, some, some of the participants asked if this uh, uh, talk will be available, recorded. So we said, yes, it's going to be available. So I, I have a question, maybe uh, as the other participants may ask questions. Uh, so uh, thank you for the, for the presentation, first of all. Uh, so this data drift, the moment we look at data, uh, whether it is drifting or not, are we assigning a timestamp to data? So are we turning, are we treating data as a time series data set? Uh, so that's the thing, that's a very good question. Uh, when you deploy your models, things become inherently time dependent uh, because distributions change in time. Uh, and that's something that is a directly a time related phenomenon. So yes, uh, you need to have some kind of timestamps. And if you deploy your models, the simplest timestamp and basically the preferred way to get timestamp is just the time of inference. So whenever your model or whenever your data is collected, whenever your model makes a prediction, uh, you can recover the timestamp as it normally already is as part of your you know, uh, infrastructure monitoring. And then you can just use that uh, as a timestamp when you need to gather it, you need to aggregate it, uh, maybe per day, per week, per hour, or per number of data points. You could also have chunks for every 10,000 data points. And then uh, you can use that to really see how things change in time. So uh, that, that continuation of that question, uh, then uh, are we going to distinguish in between data drift and say seasonality? For example, maybe data is showing the seasonality. We are only focusing on a small part of the data set and thinking that there is drift in the data set. Yeah, so that's why uh, one thing is just signals, but another thing is just looking at graphs and visualizations are very important because if you see that there is change, seasonal change, this is still technically drift, but it's kind of drift that's not going to impact your performance. And it's actually one of the prime examples of when data drift does not impact your performance. Because if your model can handle seasonality, um, you will uh, not have any issues with, uh, with performance if there is that kind of data drift. Well, thank you. Uh, so there is one question, actually, uh, as we were, to, what if the task is clustering what if the task is clustering, no classification, does it still work? Uh, yeah, so all kinds of uh, data drift detection ideas will work equally well because they don't really work with, and uh, they don't require any kind of targets. And when it comes to um, evaluating performance, if you can measure the performance of your models um, in the beginning, which you should be able to before you deploy your models, you need to know whether your clustering is good or not. It's also another example of a group of use cases or family of use cases when you never get the ground truth. You never know the underlying truth uh, for whether the data point belongs to one cluster or the other. So again, here you could and should be able to estimate performance. Of course, you will use different metrics instead of using F1, ROC AUC, RMSE, anything like that. Uh, you will be using things like silhouette score. Uh, right, so class uh, of metrics. And to be honest, because right now we haven't seen a lot of pull from for that kind of use cases, Nanimal does not support explicitly uh, class, uh, clustering and unsupervised learning. But if there is a need for that, we will think about incorporating those. And of course, you can contribute your, your own code because it's just a different metric. Thank you. So another question is, how big should be the reference data? Oh. Uh, 
so what we're doing is we're uh, in the in the library you will see um, the so-called minimum chunk size and so we're revamping that and generally speaking each chunk should be between at least 300 data points and depending on the properties of the data set especially if the data is uh, very imbalanced the problem is very imbalanced you basically should look at at least 200 data points for the minority class. Uh, so that's one thing to look at it. So there's no absolute number here. And the data, the reference data set should have, let's say at least, and these are just rough estimates, five chunks. So we're looking at 1,500 data points as the absolute minimum, the more the better, of course. Uh, so so there, is, there is one question, but before that, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, let me read the question for you. You propose to use VAE. Etc. for data compression and decompression. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not sure what VAE, you, you got VAE, right? Yeah, uh, variation out encoders. Yeah. So uh, how do you decide the correct size of the VAE? Yeah, uh, that's again a very good question. Uh, so at the current stage, we couldn't. Uh, that's why by default, uh, you can uh, choose as the encoder. And uh, the only one that's available is PCA. And UMAP is extremely unstable. We are not able to get UMAP to work at all. With VAE, we had much more success, um, but it's something that will come later in the, in the library uh, because again, it's a hard problem. And basically the ideas here that we are going to do and we haven't implemented that yet is um, hyperparameter tuning, as simple as that. And we need to figure out how to do it reasonably fast and get to a stable solution. Uh, before the next question, uh, so uh, when you when, let's say you, you begin to observe data drift, so is there any metric, uh, any uh, anything that we can rely on to think that we need to retrain the model? So how how much of data drift is going to force us to retrain the model? So that is not really what we should be looking. At. That's not the metric we should be looking at. We should be looking at our performance, and we should be looking at our performance estimation. If we see, or if we can calculate performance, if we see that our estimated or realized performance is dropping significantly for a few chunks, we need to retrain. And uh, the threshold for retraining will depend on business constraint. If you work in banking, I know that some big banks uh, require you to basically write a 20 page report with why you're training, how you're retraining, what's changing before you can retrain your model because it's extremely heavily regulated. Uh, so there you will retrain only when you really need to. Uh, in things like uh, recommendation system for Netflix, uh, you automatically retrain every few hours anyway. Uh, so basically there, it's just to make sure that retraining actually works and fixes the issue because retraining doesn't always fix the issue. If you have significant shift, you will have to adjust your population to work with new distribution of the data. Thank you. And another question, what are the false positives and false negative rates, false positive and false negative rates of your algorithm, say the the off the drift detector. As a user, I don't want to miss the drift, but I don't want I don't to I don't want to get false alarms all the time. Uh, yeah, so um, there's two I'm gonna give you a two-part answer. So when it comes to performance estimation, we treat it as a we cast it as a regression task when you're trying to estimate the actual numbers. Um, and then if there is no, um, uh, sorry, if there is no concept drift uh, and there's pure data drift, we are actually getting quite good results. And by quite good, I mean mean average percentage error in low single percents. Uh, when there is no significant changes, sometimes it goes above 10%, but very rarely. So we can actually estimate performance reasonably accurately. Uh, when it comes to Data drift detection, this indeed we treat as a classification problem. So i.e. whether there is data drift or not. And then uh, we provide two kind, the kinds of boundaries. So if you look at the multivariate data drift, uh, it's going to almost never provide you false positives uh, because it captures all kinds of data drift and it's quite also reasonably robust to small changes. Uh, so it means that it will potentially miss some slight data drift. But if it says that the structure of the data has changed, you're almost guaranteed uh, that the structure of the data has changed. So you will not get a lot of false uh, positives. Um, 
but you might get some uh, false negatives. And then on the other kind of sensitivity spectrum it is univariate data detection. When if anything changes, you will know. So there is no false negatives, but as I already mentioned, there is the issue of false positives. So we kind of provide two ideas. And for the time being, it's up to the user to decide what do they prefer or how do, you want, do they combine these signals to create some kind of alerts based on that. And, and thank you. So uh, another question is, uh, so you, you mentioned the, more, uh, the probability calibration. So mm -hmm. do you think uh, when you calibrate the probability, say, say if you calibrate the probabilities from time to time, do you think this will be absorbing some of the data drift into model performance? So you're calibrating the probabilities given the data. Yeah, so uh, we are calibrating probabilities on our reference data set. We don't do it on the analysis data set. So if you use the same uh, reference data set for your analysis over time, uh, there's no effect. We will capture all kinds of data there just as well because we are not incorporating that. If you were to change uh, your reference data set, uh, you should always make sure that your reference data set is a data set that's reliable. So for which you know, that you're comfortable with data distributions there, you're comfortable with the performance there, uh, and basically we can assume that this data this data set has no data drift in it and no performance issues, uh, because otherwise you would indeed have issues with capturing some some part of data drift in it. Thank you. So uh, from the participants, are there any other questions? I think I see something in Q and A. There is, there is one question. What is the difference between change in data distribution and data correlation? Which one is data drift? Okay, um, good question again. Um, so uh, data drift is change in joint, model, uh, joint data distribution, so joint model input distribution. And that includes a uh, change in the correlations. Uh, we could look at data drift kind of from two perspectives. Change between relationship between features, uh, which is also, also data drift, uh, and changing correlations and univariate data drift when we look at each feature separately. Uh, so the difference is that change in data correlations is a subset of data drift, uh, where uh, you basically look only at change at relationship between features, but not the univariate distributions. Thank you. So there are two questions on the QA side. So could you repeat what you said about how you can use PCA or multivariate methods to detect multivariate data drift. Why is it necessary to use dimension reduction here? Uh, yeah, so uh, the idea here is uh, we're trying to learn the internal structure of the data. And the easiest way to do it is to train some kind of encoder that is forced to learn the internal structure of the data in order to accomplish its task, which is reduce dimensionality. So we're using it simply as a tool to learn the internal structure of the data. And that's why uh, we're uh, using data drift. Uh, sorry, we're using the, the dimensionality reduction, sorry. Uh, thank you. So another question is, if possible, should our system, say an autonomous robotic application, be designed to collect data and perhaps analyze incoming data and compare non-parametrically, maybe, to parts of the original training set recognize its model is no longer valid. Absolutely, that's exactly kind of the essence of machine learning monitoring. Uh, so this is the point here. Uh, I see it's from Edward. I think you really nailed um, the problem here. Uh, the point is that if something goes wrong and the model is no longer valid, you need to know because otherwise you might be, you might be going from positive uh, ROI per loan given to negative uh, ROI per loan given, which might lead to, you know, literally banks going bankrupt and triggering another financial crisis. Uh, so um, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely necessary. And it is possible. And this is exactly what you should be doing. And you can do it via using an email uh, packaging in a container, putting in an airflow, just part of your uh, ML ops flow. And uh, and then you can see if your model is no longer valid. So another question, but PCA is used only for numerical data, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. how do you treat data drift if it is categorical? Okay, that's a very nice question. We're really going deep here. And the way we do it is kind of hacking, but it works in practice. 
uh, which is we do, if I remember correctly, frequency encoding for categorical data. Uh, we couldn't do one hand encoding because then uh, your categorical data would be overrepresented compared to numerical data, so it's numerical features. Uh, so we're doing frequency encoding. We're treating that frequency encoding uh, as basically our column instead of the categorical data, and uh, we're putting that in the PCA. Thank you. So any any other questions from the from the participants? Great questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Wojtek, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, I truly enjoyed it. I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And thank you for the participants. And uh, we would like to see you in, in our next programs. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And till next time. Bye. Bye.